With the concepts of induction and conduction now understood, students can see a practical demonstration of it using an object called the electroscope. Electroscopes come in various shapes and sizes. This is a fairly common one. We start with a glass container here, and inside of it we have a metal conductor, and we have a rubber stopper here which will insulate the conductor from the glass and hence from the ground, and two tiny gold leaves here with very little mass. We will be able to measure the sign and the magnitude of the electric charge of an object that we bring near or that touches the electroscope. Uh, we'll start with when there's no charges nearby and you basically have a neutral system. The gold leaves will hang straight down like this due to their own mass. We will be showing here how electroscopes can be charged by both conduction and induction. Electroscopes are not new. Here's a picture of an antique one from the year 1878, and you can pretty much tell the date by the uh, sleeve here on the person operating the electroscope. You can see here, here's the top of it, where they have a little uh, sphere. Here are the two gold leaves. Instead of a beaker-like apparatus, they have a tube here, and this object right here is a charged rod. Here's the setup for charging an electroscope using conduction. We will start up here with the rod that has a negative charge on it, negative 4E. We will be bringing it close and we will actually touch this sphere up here. Based on what we've talked about earlier, the excess negative charge will distribute itself as far as it can. So it will start at the conductor at the top, at the sphere, spread out down until it reaches the gold leaves, and then each gold leaf will have a net negative charge. Since they both have the same charge, we will expect them to repel each other. The negatively charged rod is brought next to the electroscope. It touches the sphere. The extra negative charge spreads out down the rod and distributes itself equally amongst the two leaves. Since they both have a negative charge on them, they will repel each other. And you can see how they've spread out here. So now you have a net negative charge on the electroscope. The other interesting point is the rod here now has less negative charge than when it started because it gave some of it up to the electroscope. And because of the conservation of charge, if this gains negative charges, this must lose the negative charges. Now, this exact same result can be obtained if you use a positive net charge. In that case, you'd have po excess positive charge here. They would still repel. It would still look like that. We'll talk a little bit later about how to figure out whether you had a positive or a negatively charged rod. A neutral electroscope can also be charged by induction. For example, if a bar with a negative net charge is brought near the scope, then the electrons in the electroscope will move down to the leaves and the leaves will repel. If the bar is removed, the, there will be no force pushing the electrons down, they'll return back to their original positions, the leaves will go down. So this inductive effect is temporary. No charge is transferred from the rod to the leaves because, of, again, electrons cannot jump across the air gap. You could see a similar thing with a rod with positive net charge. Same exact thing will happen. You push it near the electroscope, the leaves will spread apart, you pull it away, the leaves will close. One more piece is needed to affect a permanent change on electroscope. This would be a great time to ask yourself or the students, what is that piece? The missing piece is a ground. A neutral electroscope is connected to the ground and a negatively charged bar or rod is brought nearby. The negatively charged rod is brought near the top of the electroscope but does not touch it. Electrons in the scope will be repelled out of the scope down to the ground thus leaving a net positive charge on the electroscope, so the gold leaves now have positive charges and they will repel each other. Note, when we talked earlier about the spheres and charging by induction, the charge on the rod that charged them did not change. And again, the same case here. Whatever charge was here in the beginning is still what we have at the end. The reason this is now a positively charged electroscope is excess electrons went to ground. We can also use a positively charged rod for induction. So over here we have a positively charged rod. We bring it near the top of the electroscope. In this case, electrons are attracted from the Earth. Remember, the Earth has an infinite source of electrons, and it can either accept them or donate them. 
In this case, they travel up out of the ground, spread out on the electroscope. You now have negative charges here at the bottom. They will still repel itself. And again, the charge on the rod does not change. If the charging bar is removed while the ground is still attached, the electrons will still have a path to ground. So they can either go down to the ground or come up from the ground. In either case, the electroscope will now be neutral again. The leaves will fall back to, uh, together with each other. If you want to leave the charge on the electroscope, which also keeps the leaves separated, the ground must be removed before the charging bar. Now the electrons have nowhere to go and you will leave a net positive or negative charge on the electroscope. Now in this case, if you use a positive rod in induction, what you get at the end is a negatively charged electroscope. Electroscope. If you have a negative rod, your end result will be a positively charged electroscope. This is opposite from charging it by induction, where the electroscope comes up with the same charge as the charging rod. In induction, it's the opposite. When the leaves of the electroscope repel and move far apart from each other, there's a charge present. It could be either positive or negative. To find out what the charge is, you can take an object that has a known charge, either positive or negative, place it near the top of the scope, and watch what happens. For example, if you take a positively charged object, you move it near the electroscope, and the leaves move apart. Well, what's happening there? More positive charge is being pushed down from the top of the scope into the leaves, so they move further apart. That seems to indicate that the existing charge is positive, and there you go. If the leaves are moved closer together, that means if they had a negative charge, you're pushing more positive charge down there. That'll make it less negative. There'll be a less, less force between the leaves. And yes, that's true. And then you can likewise see if the object has a negative charge, the electroscope leaves move further apart. You would imagine that the electroscope would be charged negatively. And then, of course, the opposite. If they move closer, there was a positive charge. Earlier it was mentioned that electroscope can be used to find both the type of charge on an object and also the magnitude of it. Intuitively, it would seem that the further apart the leaves move, the greater the magnitude or size of the charge present. If it was a tiny charge, the leaves wouldn't move very far at all. If it was a large charge, you would see them move quite dramatically. And hopefully, if you've already done this demonstration, you've seen that effect. So that's true. The next section will talk about the force due to electric charges. This is the charge that has the leaves moving against the forces of gravity, which are trying to hold them down and the tension in the leaves that's trying to hold them in position.